Hi and welcome to the Wild Gut Project. My name's Carrie. Um, in this video, I'm going to be giving you an overview of IBS or irritable bowel syndrome. Some almond milk and tea. So this is going to be the first video in a long series I'm going to be producing, going really in depth into IBS and the research there is around it just to help you understand exactly what the condition is and ways to deal with it. And I'll also be doing ones about FODMAP, obviously, and veganism. Like this video and subscribe so you can get notifications about those videos when I produce them each week on a Wednesday. So what is IBS or Irritable Bowel Syndrome? It's kind of a catch-all phrase for a range of digestive symptoms and unlike inflammatory conditions such as inflammatory bowel disease and Crohn's and colitis, the intestinal walls don't actually look inflamed or any different. The symptoms include diarrhea, constipation, bloating or excess gas, excess flatulence, abdominal pains, abdominal cramps, and distended stomachs. So I know I look kind of pregnant if I eat the wrong foods because my stomach is so swollen. Although on the grand scheme of things those symptoms are quite mild, they obviously do have a really profound impact on the sufferer's quality of life. And then there are different types. So if you experience diarrhea 25% or more of the time, then you have IS, um, IBSD. If you have constipation 25% or more of the time, it's called IBSC. There's also an alternating type or IBSA, or sometimes IBSM for mixed, depending where you look. And that's where you have constipation or diarrhea 25% or more of the time. And there's also a kind of unspecified kind that doesn't really fit either of those particular boxes, but you do have digestive issues chronically most of the time. So I just want to put a serious note in here. If you have those symptoms and you're also experiencing rectal bleeding or abdominal pain that persists into the night or starts in the night or and or unexplained weight loss, it could be you have something a bit more serious. So if you do have any of those or you think you might, definitely get yourself to the doctor as soon as possible. And even if you do just experience IBS, it's really worth making an appointment with your GP to see what they can do to help you. So how is IBS diagnosed? They'll take a case history, so they'll ask about the symptoms you've been experiencing, how long, how frequently, and they will also ask about your family, whether there's a family history. They'll probably do a physical examination, see how swollen or painful your stomach is, and they might want to do a more invasive diagnostic investigation, such as a colonoscopy or taking a stool sample, and that can help them rule out more serious conditions like inflammatory bowel disease or cancer. So one criteria used for diagnosis is the Rome 4 criteria, which is where you have abdominal pain either related to defecation, changes in stool consistency, or changes in the frequency of stool. And that would be for at least one day a week for the last three months with symptoms starting six months ago. So it's quite, you can see with that kind of criteria, it's a very long-term chronic condition, which obviously can really affect your quality of life. So what are the risk factors for IBS? Why me? Why have I got it? Why have you got it if you're watching this? The onset is between generally the age 20 and 45. It's twice as likely in women. It's also much more likely if someone in your family has it. And more seriously, it has quite a strong connection to mental health. So if you have anxiety or depression, you're much more likely to have IBS. And also if you have a history of physical or psychological abuse, you're more likely to go on to develop IBS. So what's actually causing those symptoms? The research at the moment really isn't that clear. Because it is such a catch-all term, and because it's only recently being started to be taken seriously as a condition, there isn't actually much sort of clear research. There are some theories though. So one theory is that there's a difference in our intestinal walls. Our intestines are lined with muscles and they do a very, um, actually very complicated movement called peristalsis where they sort of squeeze like a wave, moving your food along, digesting it, breaking it up. Um, so it's thought that perhaps in people with IBS, that movement isn't quite right. So the food either moves too quickly and you get diarrhea, or it goes too slowly and you end up having lots of water kind of seeping out of the food and it becomes painful. So that complicated movement of peristalsis being mixed up is one potential reason. Another theory is related to the nervous system. The enteric nervous system, all the nerves around your intestines, are actually um, as numerous as all the neurons found in the brain of a cat. So 
It's pretty smart. Smart gut. So there is a theory that perhaps people with IBS will feel just more pain, they're more sensitive to the normal feelings of digestion. And another theory is that the neurons are poorly coordinated. The neurons don't give the correct information to your brain and your body overcompensates and then you start to feel pain. And then a more recent theory, because it's still kind of a burgeoning area of research, is that it might be due to a change in the microbial community in your gut. So you probably know that your intestines are full of amazing bacteria that digest your food for you. Well, if that community is disrupted for a huge range of reasons, they could then digest your food differently, produce different chemicals and lead to gas and pain and lots of issues. So again, all of those are currently kind of theories and no one really knows exactly what is happening, but they're working on it. So IBS triggers. Things to look out for or avoid or limit to try and reduce your symptoms. One big one is stress. Most people will, with IBS will say that their symptoms get a lot worse when they're under a lot of stress. So if you have a big presentation coming up, you're sitting lots of exams, there's stuff going on in your, I don't know, family or social life, you can experience more digestive issues, which is brilliant because that's exactly when you want diarrhea, when you have a big presentation. Um, another factor is hormones, and it might partly explain why more women have IBS. Women will report having worse symptoms leading up to or during their period, so their hormones are thought to be a trigger. Another factor is illness, so actually having a, an infection that causes a severe bout of diarrhoea can actually cause the onset of IBS, which has been linked to all those three theories that I listed before. And then the final major trigger is food. Your digestive system is very much affected by the food it's digesting. If that's what this channel is about, I'll have loads of videos about this and actually everything in this video I'll go into way more depth in another video, so definitely subscribe if you want that. And if you have any questions, comment them down below. But are there any serious complications of IBS? Well, thankfully, kind of no. There's no really serious physical um, consequences of IBS. Like I said, if you took a biopsy or you did an endoscopy, um, a colonoscopy of someone with IBS and someone without, it will look the same. The intestines aren't inflamed or damaged, which is good. It's not physically harming you, but it does have a really quite profound impact on your quality of life. If you have unpredictable diarrhea, you're understandably going to be really anxious about going on a, a long trip where you might not have access to a toilet, or if you're constipated, you're going to feel really rubbish and you're not going to want to go dancing or you're not going to go to a party or just feel amazing and probably a very I would deem a very severe consequence of IBS is the fact it's linked to depression and anxiety it can be a chicken and egg situation as I said they're often comorbid but if your IBS does cause you to become depressed like it's really something that should be taken seriously so let's talk more about what you can do to actually manage and deal with IBS. Unfortunately, it's not curable. It's a long-term condition you have to just manage and learn to deal with, which sucks. So very commonly, a technique for dealing with it is just controlling and learning to cope with the stress in your life because stress exacerbates the problem. So meditation, yoga, trying to find solutions to sources of stress in your life can go a long way to help manage the condition. If you see your doctor, they will probably, um, they may prescribe you some medications to deal with the immediate problem. So if you're constipated, they can prescribe you some laxatives and for cramping, they can prescribe obviously pain medication and also antispasmoidal drugs. I know I always prescribe those. And um, there is some evidence that very specific probiotics help. That's definitely something to get advice from your doctor about. And then diet. Diet is the biggest thing you can do to manage your IBS. So this will be a whole huge video series, but essentially the low FODMAP diet is the only research-backed way to control it. It works in about 75% of people, and that's where you cut out fermentable oligosaccharides, monosaccharides, disaccharides, and polyols from your diet. Or at least you, you cut them down to a low level that you can manage. And there are also other dietary things you might want to limit, so um, foods very high in fat, very high in sugar can be an issue for some people, spicy foods, too much coffee, too much alcohol, too much fun, um, 
can be a problem so it's useful to keep a food diary and try and make links between some of the things you might be consuming that then lead to the symptoms. So that's just a very very quick overview about IBS. Um, definitely if you have any questions and more things you want to go, me to go into detail about definitely comment down below and I'll do some research and make a video for you. Um, yeah this is the beginning of the series so watch out for lots lots more about the research and things you can do and obviously the low FODMAP diet for vegans because the environment and the planet and animals still matter even if you have diarrhoea. So I will see you in my next video. Bye!